and Historic Preservation. He's the director of the Historic Preservation Program at UMass Amherst. He has a Bachelor's of Arts from Yale University and a PhD from UPenn. He is a Rome Prize Fellow, a Guggenheim Fellow, and a Fulbright Senior Fellow. So he's been around the world and he's examined and analyzed the built environment around the world and the importance of preserving that built environment for the disciplines of history, again, environmental science, urbanism, uh, maybe even uh, relevant to psychology, the way we organize ourselves. Uh, Dr. Page is the former president of the Massachusetts Society of Professors and a founder of Phenom, which is the Public Higher Education Network of Massachusetts, which proposes and actively supports the idea of free public higher education for students in Massachusetts. How many people are interested in that? Should be everybody. <laughs> Professor Page is not only an academic sequestered in the ivory tower, he is an activist, which Phenom is an activist pursuit. He is also a key figure in the 110,000 strong Massachusetts Teachers Association and an activist in historic preservation. He has two books that he's providing us to go into our library, Why Preservation Matters, which some of you read chapter six of for today, and Bending the Future, The Creative Destruction of New York City. So please welcome Dr. Page. Good morning. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for welcoming me to Andover High. Uh, this is, I'm really, really pleased to be here and glad that Matt invited me. In fact, I even wore a tie, which I don't usually wear when lecturing, except that I know Mr. Bach always wears a tie, so I thought I would do that. So before I get started talking about the past and how we think about the past, I want to make a little advertisement for your state university in UMass Amherst. This is our new architecture and design building. So I hope some of you, as you think about colleges, you will think about coming to UMass Amherst. It's a fantastic facility, and, a, and if you haven't visited the campus, come out and feel free to write to me, and I'll show you around. One of the other books I've written is a guidebook to UMass Amherst. All right. I want to talk about something really controversial today, and that is something you may have heard about, may have read about, which is the debate over Confederate monuments. And what do we do with these Confederate monuments from after the Civil War? And as you know, there's been big debates. If you've heard of Charlottesville, there was a riot there. People were injured. Someone died. Two people died in that. And that was started over a battle over whether to take down a statue of this guy, Robert E. Lee, the, the main general of the Confederate Army. So that's what I'm going to get to. I'm going to ask what we should be doing about that. And let me tell you, I'm going to make an argument, I'm, meaning I'm going to have a thesis. I'm going to tell you what I believe. And then I hope that we'll have some time at the end for you to ask questions and maybe challenge that. It's a big roiling debate, but, and I want, I want to hear what you have to say. But I first want to give you a quick background on what I do and what historic preservation is. And it's essentially about the question of what, if, what from the past, what buildings and places, landscapes, do we want to keep into the future? Which are, are the most important places that we want to save for the future, and why? And who gets to decide? It's a really big question, and the Confederate monument question is just one aspect of that debate. So this is one of the greatest public buildings in the United States, and I'm afraid you will never see it. Because this is Pennsylvania Station. If you've ever taken Amtrak into New York City, you or the Long Island Railroad, this is this is what you might have seen before 1966, but unfortunately they decided to tear it down, and they left it as a ruin. Out of that came the movement for preservation, which then saved Grand Central Station. If you've ever come into New York via the Metro North Line, via New Haven, you may have come into this station, and I, if you've gone to both you will know the difference architecture makes. Because that first one, it's like entering the city via the pipes of a toilet bowl, whereas if you enter through Grand Central Station, you feel like you are a god, a great citizen, entering our greatest of cities. So preservation, in a way, got its start, or at least its modern start, fighting to preserve the great buildings of this country. 
but it's also gone way beyond that. So preservation also cares about this place, somewhere you may have seen, know about. This is the Stonewall Inn, which was the launching pad, kind of the catalyst for the modern um, gay rights movement, because there was a big riot there, and out of that riot, the police brutality, came the modern um, gay rights movement. That is now a national historic landmark. That's preserved because it's a crucial part of our history. But also all over the country, in Andover, in Boston, in cities across the country, the preservation movement also tries to save the regular buildings that make nice streets and nice blocks and make the kind of the fabric of the city. So the anonymous buildings that you may not think, George Washington never slept there, nothing crucial happened there, but together they make, they make our cities livable. So that's what preservation has been about. And it's about new things today. And part of what I argue in the book that I know some of you read a chapter from is that preservation is also crucial for other reasons. It's crucial, for instance, for sustainability. We're all concerned about climate change. And the usual answer at my alma mater at Yale University is to build a new building that is, produces lots of energy and uses very little energy. And they have, they're very high tech focused. But that's not the way, actually, we're going to get ourselves out of this climate crisis. You can't build your way out of the climate crisis. You have to preserve your way out. You have to conserve your way out. So a place you may have been to, but I, or if you haven't, I urge you to go, is Holyoke. It's like, it's like Lowell West, it's one of our great industrial cities but out in Western Mass. And in that city, they have these canals. They took the Connecticut River and they diverted the canals and they put them under the buildings and they turn these turbines and that still, those turbines under that water flowing down produces most of the energy today needed in Holyoke, even though these are turbines and canals built more than 150 years ago. In other words, a place like Holyoke has to be a place that we save and reuse. So preservation, saving old buildings, is ironically a centerpiece of fighting for a more sustainable world. Another issue is that while preservation has saved the exteriors of buildings and made this nice neighborhood, this is Greenwich Village in New York City, one of the problems we have in this country is enormous inequality. And if you notice, this is a house that right there, oops, this house here, and it's sold for three and a half million dollars and now it's actually worth more like five million dollars. In other words, preservation saved the buildings, but the neighborhood, became still a place of enormous gentrification. That means a whole bunch of wealthy people moved in and poor people were kicked out. So the question is, and this is Jane Jacobs, the woman who lived there in that house and saved the neighborhood, but actually got transformed. So one of the big questions in this movement for preservation, as we debate, what do we save? How do we save it? Is how do we take, how does preservation save these buildings? This is actually my mother's house in Camden, New Jersey, still standing. It's a total ruin inside. How do we save those in a way that actually helps people, not the wealthiest, but people at the bottom end of the scale? And so part of what I write about is you go to uh, other places to find really interesting models. In Cuba, in Havana, Cuba, where I spent some time, they have trained 7,000 young people in how to do the work of preservation. And then they have renovated the houses in old Havana with good jobs, and they get to live there as well. In Berlin, a place that my father grew up, actually, a lot of these old buildings were completely derelict. These were old warehouse buildings, you know, factory buildings. They turned them over to people to do self-help housing. They re renovated themselves. They got to live there, and it's revitalized a whole neighborhood. South side of Chicago, the Astor Gates, an African-American artist and activist, policymaker, took over old abandoned buildings, turned them into cultural centers and libraries. Or Rick Lowe took these shotgun shacks. Shotgun shacks are these long houses in the south. They call shotgun shacks because they have just a, a series of doors. So you could shoot a bullet straight through the door. It would go in the fr front door, out the back. He took them over in the, one of the poorest areas of Houston and turned them into artist studios, housing and revitalize that community. And in this city, rather in Boston, nearby, I urge you to check out a group called City Life, Vida Urbana. And what are they doing? They look at old buildings and they don't look at the architecture and say, oh, we need to save it because this is a beautiful old building. They look at it and say, this is housing for um, 
lower, uh, for working class people, and we can't let Bank of America and other big banks foreclose on the property and kick people out. Many of you may have heard all over the country, big banks have been kicking people out of their homes. And so they stand out there and they block the removal of people from those homes. So this is a preservation movement as an activist movement. This is preservation saying, yeah, we care about the building, but we care equally about the people getting to stay and live in their homes and their community. And finally, and this is where I'm going to turn to, to, our, to Richmond and, uh, and uh, this question of Confederate monuments, is that one of the biggest things we face in a, in a world, in a nation that's so diverse, is looking straight at our difficult history the history of violence and discrimination of slavery and look at it and look at it in places like this like the Japanese internment camp in California or you can look all around the world and see the ways that countries have tried to deal with their past like in Berlin where they've tried to build monuments or more monuments like this to the Holocaust that they perpetrated and they've saved old ruins in order to bring people there so that they have to look at it and understand that this was the secret police of the Nazi, of Hitler's Nazi um, administration. And they've employed artists of all types. So preservation is also about how we tell stories. If I save a building and you have no idea why it was important and what happened there, it might as well be torn down. But they're, in Germany and other places, they're hiring artists to project images like this to rebring alive the history that happened there. We're putting down these little tiny stumble steps, they're called, in the ground in the front of places where Jews were removed during the Holocaust from their homes and sent to concentration camps. The idea is you stumble over it in your daily life and have to consider again what happened there. Or this, in the middle of an empty plaza, you have this glass window. What's it, what's it doing there? And you look in, it's empty bookshelves. And then you learn that this is where they, they burned books in the 1930s. Books that you, the books that are considered, were considered degenerate. And this is not just in Hitler's Germany. In America, we have cycles of times when people will say, oh, kids should not be reading those books in school and we're going to get rid of them. So this is a warning about the dangers of censorship. So how are we doing in the US on this question? Uh, that is confronting our difficult places. And we have a lot of difficult places. So for all the glories of this country, it is bathed in blood of lots of conflict over centuries. So in Money, Mississippi, a site of an awful, awful murder of a young person, Emmett Till, in the 1950s, this was one of the launch, launching pads for the modern civil rights movement. When I went there to see the place where he was murdered, it was this rundown relic. And they've stabilized it now. So at least something has changed. They put up a plaque and to at least tell the story of what happened here. But mostly around the country, we have these dull plaques that just say, you are on the National Register of Historic Places. We have not gotten creative enough about telling stories so that people can learn when they're out in public. It's a long way to go. I just learned last year about this thing called the Hanging Tree of Galead, Texas. And you can imagine when I say hanging tree, that's exactly what it was. it was. But it was for lynching of African Americans, which we often know too well, unfortunately. But it's also for the, um, let's see if I, oops. But it was also, if you can see here in this map, these are all the lynch, lynchings in the United States. And this is mainly in the South, that makes sense. But it was also in the West, Mexican Americans, by the hundreds and maybe even thousands were lynched. This is a story that you may not have learned about. We're all just discovering this. So we have a long way to go. All right, let me talk though about this one issue, this one really controversial question. What do you do with monuments like this? Look how tall this is. This is in New Orleans. That's Robert E. Lee, the general, the, the main leader of the army of the Confederacy. Remember the Confederacy broke away in, 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 uh, in 1861 and wanted to secede from the United States that led to the Civil War and 600,000 people dying. And so there it is in New Orleans. There was a decision made by the mayor and the city council to remove those statues. And why was that? And was it, was it the right thing to do? They said, it, not only do we have to tell, we can't just have this statue here anymore. And many people said it's because Robert E. Lee fought to defend slavery, and it's an insult to African Americans in that city, but maybe to everyone, to have that 
monument up there. Obviously, it's very, very controversial, and many have fought back, and that's what's leading to some of these confrontations. This is just a reminder of these are the states that seceded in the Civil War, and that is where the heart and soul of this debate is happening. I should note, there are Confederate monuments in different places all over the country, including one in Massachusetts, a little island off in the in Boston Harbor, there were buried a number of Confederate prisoners. And so there is a little monument um, to the Confederate prisoners in this state. And there and we have other monuments that also that are also controversial in their own way. Right near Boston Common, you will see this monument to Abraham Lincoln. In some ways it seems like, of course, there's Abraham Lincoln, he freed the slaves, there's a slave kneeling before him. But is that really the best message we want to send? That Lincoln freed the slaves, that it was only the, the benevolent white man who, who lifted up these slaves, when in fact the history is that slaves in a large measure freed themselves and forced the issue upon Lincoln. So we have our own controversial monuments, even if we don't celebrate the Confederacy up in the north. And I urge you on a, on a trip sometime to go, if you haven't been there, right below the State House Dome on the top of Beacon Hill is one of the great monuments to the 54th Regiment Army the African-American um, army that left from Massachusetts to go fight in the Civil War. All right, let's go back here. This is Jefferson Davis, the president of the Conf Confederacy, and you can see here how over the years the protests have begun by actually you know, um, putting graffiti on these monuments to say, this is a slave owner, how are we, how are, why are we honoring him here? Now, I show you Mount Rushmore. This is, well, George Washington, of course, Thomas Jefferson were slave owners. But this, I'm showing you this because this is one of our great public monuments out west celebrating our presidents. Well, the same guy who did Mount Rushmore did this stone mountain in Georgia in which they celebrated the leaders on a football, this is football-sized monument on the side of this massive rock in near Atlanta, Georgia, celebrate the great generals of the Confederacy. What are, we, what are we gonna do about that? And I used to live in Atlanta, and they had this big event on Saturday nights when they would have this laser show, and the laser show ends with the lasers outlining the, the, the generals, and then they ride off across again, and, people, and they play this southern tune, Dixie, and the crowd roars in appreciation that the boys are riding again. It's actually pretty, for me, I found it quite a terrifying event to see how alive that, live that celebration of the Confederacy was. So look, here's, the, here's a map of some of these Confederate monuments. You can see how many, there are hundreds and hundreds all across the South. We're, we've been reading about debates in Charlottesville and Richmond and a few other places, but there are Confederate monuments everywhere. What do we do with them? Do we take them down? Do we pulverize them? Do we move them? Do we write new new signage to explain what these really meant. I'm especially been spending time in Richmond, which was the capital of the Confederacy. And they have something, this is Robert E. Lee again, on a pedestal on something called Monument Avenue. It's one of the defining streets of, um, of Richmond. Now, if you go around Richmond, if you spend a, you know, take a stroll, you might counter Robert E. Lee Monument on Monument Avenue. You might go to the Virginia Historical Society and you'll see this beautiful, this room bathed in amber light in which you get to see the final ride of Robert E. Lee and his horse traveler. The fact that I know the name of his horse indicates sort of his place in our popular imagination. And there he is ending the Civil War when he was, was surrendering. You walk a little further, you might come across the house that he lived in, duly marked after the Civil War, when he lived there after the Civil War. Or if you go to Thomas Jefferson's design state capital, one of the most glorious state capitals in the country, you will end up, the final part of the tour is with a life-size statue of Robert E. Lee. In other words, throughout this city, Robert E. Lee is one of the most revered figures. You will encounter him in public places over and over again. The person you will not encounter is this guy, James Longstreet. Ever, anyone heard of James Longstreet? Maybe not. He's one of the most important generals in the Civil War, but you will not find a monument to him almost anywhere. In fact, it took until just in 1998, they finally put a, a monument to this important general, Confederate general, 
at Gettysburg, just in the woods somewhere far away, and then a little one in his hometown in Gainesville, Flor uh, Gainesville uh, Georgia. Why is that? Why, if we're, gonna, if, we're, if we're trying to honor, if these monuments were about honoring Civil War generals and how they fought with valor and maybe died in their service, why is it that James Longstreet's not there? Because James Longstreet, after the Civil War, said, you know what, time to give up on slavery and segregation. And he led the integrated police force in New Orleans, and he told Southerners to embrace African Americans and try to build a more integrated society. For that, he was punished with being ignored, at least by the whites in power in the South, because he was a traitor to his race. And this is where I'm getting to my argument about these. These monuments are centrally about reestablishing white supremacy after slavery was ended in the Civil War. And it was an effort to kind of put forward the great defenders of slavery into public places. And that's why I think they need to come down. James Longstreet was against that idea of reestablishing white supremacy, and so he had to be erased from the history books. Okay? Then this is an important graph. You can see this. If we think of Confederate monuments, and after this great war, this awful war, you can imagine anyone, whatever their side, you would want to honor the fallen, right? If you, everyone has a mother or a father, a brother or sister, that there's a way you want to honor the fallen for whatever they, they, for whatever the cause they died for. But if you note, right after the war, there's almost no Confederate monuments are built all the way up to the end of the century. And then they spike at the end of the century and into the new century. And then it declines again. And then what's this? A little bump in the 1950s and 60s. Okay. What's going on here is this is, if, if, we, if it was just about remembering the fallen, you would expect a big spike up here and then a slow decline, right? As you got further and further away from the event. But what this is about is that, they, that this is the effort to push back on African Americans having a role in Southern society. And so big fights begin in the late 19th century and into the 20th century to push back on that on that effort to build a more integrated South. And then again, at the, in the 1950s and 60s, what's that? That's the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King Jr. and many others. And so as a way to push back against that movement, those who were in power in the South said, let's build monuments to the Civil War as a sign about who's really still in power here. Okay, so this, when anyone asks you when these, when these monuments were put up, remember to tell them it was a big peak at the end of the 19th and into the 20th century, and then another peak in the 1950s and 60s in reaction to the civil rights movement. And if you need any further a reminder, this is a monument to the Civil War in, um, in New Orleans, and you may see it here. It's a little hard to see, but it's a monument to, built in 1991. Let's see if I have a more detail. Let me put it back here. Um, it is about reinstating, recognizing white supremacy in the South. Sometimes we hear that phrase, white supremacy, and it seems like it's a phrase of today. But this is a monument from 1891 in which they were saying, we're going to reestablish white supremacy in the South. This is a very, very troubling issue, and it's worth noting, because not all the monuments said that. Some of the monuments tried to pretend they were about states' rights and about the valor of the fallen. But I would argue, um, and this is a weekend debate, it was centrally about reestablishing white power in a South that had, could have gone much more integrated. And it took another century, and frankly, we're still involved in that question of how integrated and equal a society we can build. So there is that monument coming down, and there is the Robert E. Lee monument coming down again in New Orleans, and there's the counter protests. And there is an there is a, sometimes violent and sometimes angry, sometimes principled or sometimes deeply emotional effort to defend these monuments. And I would argue we have to think carefully about what are the motives of people who want to defend these monuments. Some feel deeply this is about heritage, this is about honoring fallen soldiers. I would argue that you can't avoid what those monuments stood for when they were, when they were built. And you can see here in, in uh, Richmond, Black Lives Matter movement has, a, has made a focus of this. And there is Monument Avenue, there's the Lee Monument, and it goes on for a mile. It's considered one of the great streets of America, right? 
There's a reason why they built this beautiful street with these monuments. It was to establish this as the, the establish that the, this great city would be built on the legacy of the Confederate generals. It's a very powerful and disturbing idea. There's Jeff Davis again, the president of the Confederacy. He had the Confederate White House in Richmond. There was something called the Confederate White House where he led that brief country. And you can see here, it's about Jefferson Davis. You'll never see the word slavery here, right? Defenders of the rights of states, exponent of constitutional principles. This was an effort to transform what the Civil War was about through these monuments. So the one in New Orleans was quite honest. We're about white supremacy. Well, a little bit later, they got a little more subtle and said, well, actually, we were never fighting to defend slavery. We were fighting on constitutional principles to protect states' rights, and, um, to, and it's the basic defending the Constitution. So this is an important part of the transformation of what the Civil War was about, at least an attempt to tell a new story. One effort to transform Monument Avenue was to put up a statue to an African-American. Arthur Ashe, son of Richmond, great tennis player. But for many, this has not been enough. Just adding on another monument doesn't make up for the ones that are offensive that are already there. Now you can see there are people stationed outside around the Jeff Davis monument to, do, to defend against it. Now many artists now have been creatively thinking about what to do with these. So one argument is just blow it up. And I'm going to argue that's the wrong thing to do. Every authoritarian regime that has existed has wanted to blow up the previous era's monuments. Pulverizing it, trying to erase it, is the wrong way to go. So I'm against erasure. Um, others say, let's play with the monument. Let's flip it upside down. All right, Jeff Davis, I mean, Robert E. Lee wants to be there, that's fine. But we're going to turn him upside down because his idea of the nation was upside down. One of the more creative ones I like is this one where they said, well, okay, he wanted to defend a public auction of people, slavery, slave trading. Richmond was one of the central slave trading places in the southern states. Why don't we put him up for public auction and see what happens? I happen to believe that what we should be doing is collecting all those monuments and moving them to the grounds of Stone Mountain Park in Stone Mountain, Georgia. So that big park right beneath that, that Confederate Mount Rushmore, why don't we move all the monuments from around, the, from around the south, so we don't destroy them, but we put them in like this Confederate monument museum on the grounds of uh, Stone Mountain, Georgia. Now let me, I wanna take your final little bit here to talk about a project that I've been working on with some of my students at UMass and some colleagues in Richmond. Because there's, here's what's going on there. In Richmond, people are saying, we gotta tear down the Robert E. Lee Memorial Monument and the other Confederate memorials, they don't have a right to occupy public space like that. We should be honoring, we should be putting in public places the things we honor, and we don't honor what they stood for. But uh, activists I've been involved with say, yeah, that's only part of the problem. We can't just tear down those monuments. We've got to also tell the story of African Americans, of enslaved people, and the struggle against slavery in that city. So they are focused on a place called Shaco Bottom. And Shaco Bottom is here in the lowlands. They call the bottoms is where the river was, a sort of lowlands of the city. And in that area, and that's so, here's, here is the that lowlands. Jefferson's monument, I mean, the state house is up here. The, the, uh, the Jeff Davis White House is over here, all in sight of Shaco Bottom. What happened in Shaco Bottom? It was 300,000 people bought and sold. It was the second largest slave market in the United States in the 19th century. And there you see a famous image of slavery taking, of the slaves being sold. And um, if you can see what this is, what this indicates, there's a whole industry. There was a people who clothed the enslaved people in preparation for their sale. This is not just this is a whole world, a whole ecosystem, an e economic ecosystem that frankly is behind a lot of the wealth that still exists in Richmond and Virginia. And this is what it looks like today. I-95, the big highway that starts up here in Boston, you take that road far enough, you will travel over slave trading sites, you will slap, you will travel over the graves of thousands of African Americans who died while in captivity in Richmond paved over, there's a train, there's parking lots, 
Virginia Commonwealth University took over uh, one whole section under which were the, were the graves of African Americans and turned it into a parking lot. And the activists have tried to uncover this history, doing makeshift memorials for where the burial ground was. What you're seeing up there, this is the embankment for I-95. There's eight lanes of highway right above there and on top of these former graves. This is Anna Edwards, an incredible hero who has been fighting for 15 years now and to some success to tell the story of what happened in Shaco Bottom as an antidote to what, ha what M Monument Avenue tells. And what you're seeing here is her, one of her big successes. She took back that parking lot and at least turned the former African burial ground into a grassy area. And there's an effort now to build a memorial park. And there she is with some of the activists who have been fighting that uh, battle. This is what they wanted to build on top of the slave trading site and burial ground, a minor league baseball stadium. This was the city's big push. And Anna and her activists said, absolutely not. You are not gonna once again destroy. You covered over the history, but you are not, not gonna do it once again. We're gonna, we want this history told. And so there is that, that that with their first great success, and now the battle is how to tell that story better. And this is part of this place is so important because of an enslaved man named Gabriel, who in 1900 led a revolt, a failed revolt. He was killed, hung right here, but he led an early revolt against slavery. And there is one of those parking lots, and they've started to do archaeology to uncover these slave sites, and there you can see one of the slave pens and trading places right beneath I-95. And they, this fight continues on, and they are saying this is sacred ground and it needs to be protected. This is preservation, uncovering the stories that have been long submerged in order to tell a fuller story of the city and our country. And they take this walking tour I've gone on where they go to the different sites in the neighborhood, including this gas station under which there are the remains of a slave workshop and slave, um, slave prison. We were brought down to, t to try to develop a plan for a memorial park, this nine acre memorial park, to try to tell that story and honor the past. And here you can see the overview. So this is I-95, this is the train, train line. These are some of the remaining uh, parking lots. And we've built on the African burial ground a park to remember the people who were there. And we are imagining, instead of Monument Avenue, a grove of lights around a plaza, and then a long digital wall where we would tell, name all the, as many enslaved people across Virginia have, have been found in the archives across that state. So give people actual names who've just been treated as numbers, including Gabriel, the leader of that revolt. And here is that area that we have, our, our students really were essentially to designing this con contemplative place to, to honor with the history that happened there. And we want to do what we, they did in Cuba, which is to build this center for, where students can learn about urban farming, where they can learn about preservation, where they can learn about sustainability and get jobs doing that work of repairing and restoring um, Richmond. And then one of the final things I'll, I'll point out is on these big, tall columns we want to create. We don't want people thinking of Robert E. Lee when they go to Richmond. We, they, we want them to think of Shaco Bottom. So all along these tall lights, what we've done, if you can, a little bit hard to see, but we have created a kind of punctured steel in, to create a pixelated image. So if you can kind of see, this is the image of Gabriel that you saw earlier on that digital wall. So that from a distance, from maybe I-95 or from up on Broad Street near City Hall, you will look down and you will see on all these columns African Americans who have been long erased from history, now in places of, of positions of prestige and pride, so that people going by will not think, oh yeah, this is the home of Robert E. Lee and Jeff Davis. They go, no, this is the place of Maggie Walker or, um, or Gabriel Prosser. And we will start to change the story about what Richmond stands for. Indeed, there is change afoot. This is Maggie Walker, the first female bank president anywhere in the United States. She also happened to be African-American, led a series of companies and banks that were an anchor to the African-Americans of Richmond. So there's progress being made. We're starting to expand
like a wide angle lens of your camera to start to look at who really mattered in the city. And it's important that we do that in public places. But I'll just end with this kind of, you know, just a warning. There's still so much work to do. This is Evergreen Cemetery in Richmond. So even though all this debate has been going on in Richmond, look how over, completely overgrown is the major African American cemetery in, in that city. In other words, literally the people of the past who are marked here with their names and when they lived and what they did, completely overgrown. So this work, there's exciting work going on in, in trying to tell the history of difficult sites, but the work is so much more work to be done and I'm hoping that you all will do some of it. Thank you. So if you're willing, I'd love to hear questions or your comments on this. You can come over to one of the microphones. Hi, Professor Page. Um, when you told us your plan for um, moving all of the monuments to the base of Stone Mountain, yeah. Um, my primary reaction was that it may become a hub for um, Confederate supporters. It become um, what? Like a hub for com Confederate um, ideals and supporters. What are your thoughts on that? So that's definitely that's that's a very good it's a very good warning. In fact, in, interesting in Berlin, which I showed you a bit about, they refuse the city government refuses to actually mark the place where Hitler died. You know, he died in his bunker. They, you have to find it on maps, but it won't be marked because they're worried for exactly that same thing. I agree with that. I think the, the, the greater risk is if we actually just erase that history because it's an important history to remember. In other words, Robert E. Lee needs not to be honored, but he does need to be remembered. And so there is a risk. You're absolutely right. And they will attempt to make it a pilgrimage site, but, but they're already using the monuments as pilgrimage sites already. So good question. What kind of monuments uh, or parts of history should be like forgotten, or are there any? Say the last part, they should, what should be forgotten? Um, parts of history that maybe shouldn't have monuments built in the first place, if any. Well, I mean, I, you know, in, in my ideal world, we would not have gone through this crucible of uh, ens enslaving people and then celebrating those who defended it. Um, but I guess that's the kind of the point, is that we have the right today to say, okay, these are important parts of history, but we don't need to leave them in public spaces. Lots of historians, frankly, a lot of my colleagues say, oh, you gotta leave them there, and we'll put up other signs, and we'll tell the story. And I, res I respect that idea, but when we leave big monuments in public spaces, it's saying to all our citizens, this is what we care about, this is what matters. That's why I think they have to be disembodied, literally removed from that site. Um, do you think that these statues um, contribute to widespread racism, like anti-Semitism and Islamophobia today? Uh, so you mean the presence of these monuments, allowing them to exist? Um, I think, I, here's what I would say about them. There's, there's years go by in which they are kind of ignored, in which you could say, well, they're not really doing anything bad, they're just kind of there, people ignore them, and there, as I say, there are hundreds of these monuments throughout the South. But to me, they have this latent power. They're ready to be exploited, like in this era we're in, when we have leadership that wants to promote division and promote racism and anti-Semitism. Suddenly, these monuments are ready-made for people who want to rally for those bad causes. Do you think that the motivation behind the monument matters, such as a Confederate monument from during the Civil War versus from during the Civil Rights period? Does the, the motive for putting them up? Yeah. Well, so this is that's an excellent question, because of course those who defend them, and there are, I, will, I wanna respect that there are people who say, this is simply my heritage. I'm from this, this, this from Alabama. My great-grandfather fought in this war. It's part of my own personal heritage, therefore I don't have a racist motive. So, so I get that. But the fact is that they were put up for that motive 
and those who they were directed at, and I'm talking about African Americans, especially in the South, it is understood to this day that that's what they're for. So to me, removing them honors the, the kind of 100 year long hurt that's been imposed. And so that's difficult, because then people say, why are you dishonoring my heritage? And that's the difficult conversation to have, to say, we can honor your great-grandfather in, in another way, but not in a public space like this, for a per, for, especially for a person like Robert E. Lee, who is clearly seeking to defend slavery. Thank you. Sure. Do you think that we should be having monuments at all? Like, why should we have monuments on either <laughs> side? That's a very good question. In fact, um, we have been living in the last couple decades through an absolute explosion in the number of monuments, right? So, do, you know, you guys may not remember 9-11, um, but you, you certainly know about it. The day after 9-11, there was calls, discussions about what the monument would be to remember that. Whereas there was not a, built a, mon a national monument to World War II for 50 years. There's usually a lag time between an event and then wanting to put up a monument to remember it. That, lag, that gap has narrowed and narrowed. And we've been proliferating monuments. So I actually think it's a good question about if we are building too many monuments. But right now, on this issue, we have to deal with the ones that, were, that proliferated in the South and what, and what to do with them. Um, so why do you think um, Europe is more aware, like, Europe is more aware than the Americas? So that's good, also a very good question. And actually, one of the, in order to shorten this, to allow we could have questions, I took out a few slides from places I've spent where they are trying to ignore their history completely. And I would argue that the Germans are at the forefront, frankly, because they perpetrated the Holocaust in World War II, but places like Austria, who were complicit, um, Italy, with their leader Mussolini in World War II, was also a fascist. They have not really confronted their history in the same way. But um, I do think the key is, it wasn't just, a, it wasn't, um, it didn't come from on high. It was artists and activists at the bottom demanding that the history be told. In fact, one sh picture I showed of that ruin, like kind of that, the Nazi headquarters that was just like a landscape with some ruined buildings, that was an activist group of young people. They went out there and they literally started doing kind of guerrilla archaeology. It was like left over, it was going to be ignored by the city, and they just started digging. And they said, we got to, to tell the story because we know this is where people were tortured. This is the headquarters of the Nazi, the Nazi um, police. Good question. Hi, um, do you think there's a conflict of interest between us turning our nose to Confederate monuments, yet we glorify a man such as Christopher Columbus, who, uh, although he came here to and discovered America, he killed millions of Native Americans on the way and spread disease as well? This is, God, boy, you guys have great questions. It's absolutely, but there is an absolute, um, I would argue, contradiction if we ignore that. Frankly, what's going on in New England has, is, um, is starting to recognize, and we haven't gone nearly further enough, how much economic power of New England was dependent on slavery, right? The cotton came from the South and came to the factories in New England. So we're absolutely complicit in that. And I think I actually have a bunch of slides of universities that are recognizing that so, many of, so much of their endowments come from wealth that was generated in part through slavery. So a lot, lot of people are, are wor there's a slippery slope argument. Some people are saying, oh, if we start tearing Columbus monuments down, we're gonna do that for everything else. I'm not worried about slippery slopes. I'd rather us have that debate. Which monuments, which names, which holidays do we need to either get rid of or change their names? To me, it's much better to have that open debate and argue about it. And some things will decide, we'll keep that monument, but we'll put our, you know, art projects around it, art, art, you know, public art projects to reinterpret it. Other places will say, no, we gotta take it down. In my town, we've changed the name of Columbus Day to uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. So there's a lot of ways um, to go about it, but to me, the most important thing is we actually confront it, recognize the history, and, and talk about it. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, back to your idea of putting all the monuments um, 
near Stone Mountain. Do you think a controlled place like a museum could serve that purpose just as well? A uh, which museum? Uh, just a museum. A museum, yes. So the other idea, absolutely, like in Richmond they are building um, a new museum to the history of the Civil War in, in, in Virginia. And it's on a big, it's in an old factory building, the Tredegar Iron Works. And so one of the ideas is actually that some of the monuments, at least in Richmond, would go to there. That's also legitimate. To me, then, they become historical objects that we don't revere, but we actually look at and discuss. So absolutely, it could be there. I, and I should be clear, there was a Washington Post writer who proposed this idea. Let's take Stone Mountain and make it the new museum of Confederate monuments. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, so you had mentioned before changing the story of um, kind of what those Confederate monuments symbolize. Uh, is there a plan for preservation to um, maybe add other, not other monuments, but like something else um, that would enforce that, I don't know, I don't want to say the right story, but you know, what we stand for is being told because there may be a potential out of mind, out, out of sight, out of mind. Right. I mean, if you remove the monument, then you won't tell any story. No, that's, that's a very good, good point. Um, and I think that's where, partly where the movement for Shaco Bottom is. Like, oh, the, the argument there is, why, if we just tear down the monuments, the monument now, then what are we left with? We've got to tell a different, a different story. So I think you're absolutely right. And I think, um, even though I just said that I'm a little wary about the proliferation of monuments, I'm a little worried that we put, we're just building too many, on the other hand, part of the reason we're building more is because we're starting to honor other people whose stories um, have been completely ignored. It's, um, you know, a lot of people say that, pe that Americans don't care about their history, and I hope this debate that's going on about the Confederate monuments makes us realize that it's completely false. People care deeply. That doesn't mean they necessarily read books that I write, but they care deeply about the past as they understand it. Thanks, good question. Hi, so um, like for the, um, the controversial thing of people kneeling for the pledge or yeah, football games and stuff, do you think that's an example of like changing the meaning of uh, let's say, not like the, mo the monument or whatever, but like the meaning of the song? That's, that's, that's a great point. Um, you know, the, some of the monuments I showed, like the projections on the wall or the little stumble stones, this is a movement called counter-monuments, monuments that kind of challenge us and push us to re rethink. And that simple act that Colin Kaepernick started of saying, I'm going to kneel, I'm gonna, that's making it go like, well, what, what are we honoring? What, and why would people feel that they can't honor and don't want to honor that flag? So I absolutely think that that's kind of a a dramatic monument. It's an enactment of a challenge to what that symbol is. Yeah, it's really powerful. Thank you. Do you think it's possible to have a monument that preserves history, but also is able to show both sides of the story to a point where it doesn't cause major controversy? Hmm, that's interesting. I think, um, I mean, frankly, to my mind, a good monument always causes controversy. There's a famous um, Austrian writer who said, there's nothing as forgettable as a monument. And there's this German word for it called Kranzwerfstelle. I guess people don't study German much anymore, but this, it's one of the, German has these long, long words. It simply means a wreath-throwing place. It's a place where, you know, where the dignitary, the president goes and like leaves a wreath and then everyone goes home and has lunch. It means it's a place where memory goes to die. So this whole movement for counter-monuments counter is actually to challenge, challenge people to have debate. That said, there are some really interesting monuments which try to look at all sides of an event. And there's one in Berlin in which they took a monument that was there that was built by the, by the socialists, East Germany in the 1960s, and they put a glass, plexiglass around it in which they told a more, a more updated story. So you get to still see the original, and you can try to understand why they said that, and then you have a more accurate story of that event. And that does provoke debate, like why are there two different stories here? What was the purpose for having, what was the motive for having a very different story? It's good. 
So we have only about three minutes left. Okay. Anyone else? So um, if we could just give Dr. Page a round of applause. Thank you all. Thanks.